So now it's time for uh, panel two, and we will um, first hear um, first hear Mary Kobel here quite soon. Uh, she is an artist and a senior lecturer lecturer in the Fine Art and Photography MFA programs at Valen Academy of Art. Uh, through live work and inst installations, Kobel addresses. Uh, problems of bodily and so societal navigation, focusing on issues of normativity and injustice. Uh, and uh, after that, we will also hear Sarah Barnes. Um, Sarah Barnes is an independent researcher, writer and curator, working within the in intersections between art and science. Um, when she was awarded her PhD, um, on the autopsic art, sublime object, spectacular on contemporary art and the open body in 2004. And so, uh, yeah, start. Thanks. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into one work that I've done that uh, talks maybe with, along, against, and maybe doesn't address some of the things we've talked about so far. <laughs> um, but I was invited to the Corcoran uh, Gallery of Art in 2013. And the invitation was because there was a, a, ser a performance series happening. I had lived in Washington for about 10 years. When I left Washington, uh, then they decided to invite me back to make some work. It was under the premise of I could do uh, anything I wanted within the, uh, within the gallery um, in any space. And I understood that that came with the premise of me perhaps writing a proposal and anything being something that never can really happen. Um, so as part of my ongoing inquiry into discriminatory practices against the queer community, this work, Deferred, uh, addresses the targeted exclusion of men who have had sex with men. We, we could broadly say gay men um, from donating blood uh, in, in the U.S. According to the FDA, men who have had sex with other men since 1977 are deferred as blood donors. This has actually changed within the past year, so now uh, gay men only have to be celibate for one year before donating blood, which many have um, praised as being uh, such forward thinking, and I would still conclude that that's an extremely homophobic and discriminatory practice. So the deferral of gay men was instituted out of fear and lack of knowledge. Um, at the time, in order to protect the blood supply um, that was really uh, decimated along with the lives of many gay men at the time. So I'm not contesting the fact that um, uh, the U.S. blood supply um, was uh, seriously damaged at one point. And due to lack of knowledge, uh, regulations were set up. Um, which prohibited gay men from donating blood. Um, times have changed since then. Our knowledge have changed. We know a lot more. Um, and now we can, we, I can say that this practice is uh, really discriminatory and it really re reinforces prejudices that still exist that HIV is a gay disease. Um, so regardless of uh, the progress in this new draft, which is still in like the proposal stages, uh, gay men are still de deferred, and deferred, the word means um, like not able to do that now, prolonged until sometime else, or maybe until you stop thinking or asking about it. Um, so to set up the work, I need to first talk about the site in which it was created. The Corcoran Gallery of Art um, was one of the oldest privately uh, supported cultural institutions in Washington, D.C. Um, it was started by uh, William Wilson Corcoran in 1969 and focus, focused uh, mostly on American art. Uh, their mission statement uh, was, to sub was dedicated to, quote, dedicated to art and used solely for the purpose of encouraging the American genius. So I thought, wow, like what a place to be able to, to go into. Um, it also has a... Um, College of Art and Design attached to it. And I'm saying was because in 2014, this uh, gallery or museum stopped to exist in the form it was in when I worked in it. 
Uh, so right now, the 17,000 work collection is owned by the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and the building and the school is ran by George Washington University. Uh, this had been in the work for decades, evidently, of uh, supposedly, supposed like mismanagement of um, funds as one, was one way to, to state it, um, financial problems. But basically in 2014, the Corcoran trustees uh, broke the founder's deed of trust by going to court to have the Corcoran dissolved as an institution. So this may or may not play into my work. I didn't know this was happening, and I didn't know it was so imminent to happen at the time. I'm sure it was known within the museum, but that's something I've really reflected on when I'm talking about this work. So I'm going to set up the site. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about some work that was previously there. Then I will talk about my work, and then I will follow up by a bit of negotiation that had to happen between uh, the gallery and I. I can't talk about the, the Corcoran Museum of Art, Gallery of Art, without talking about the Robert Maplethorpe retrospective uh, called The Perfect Moment. And this was set to travel to the Corcoran Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, from previous showings uh, in Philadelphia and in Chicago. It's about 150 photos. Uh, it's, it's in book form. It's an amazing exhibition, uh, formal portraits, flowers, children, and quote, sexually explicit gay and sadomasochistic erotics. Um, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of Robert Mablethorpe's work, uh, I, I think, is characterized by kind of a rejection of the dominant uh, narratives of social, cultural, and political representation of gay men, for example. Uh, so these are some of the images, but I'll show you four more of the images that could be considered maybe the, the most contested works. Uh, these works were brought to light by the Family Association, um, the American Family Association, supported by a senator of um, North Carolina, which is my home state, as is Lauren, who just spoke home state. He um, basically went to the National Endowment for the Arts, which is a huge funding body in the United States that gave a lot of money to the Corcoran to the tune of around 30,000 um, US dollars. And he got 100 congressmen, so state or uh, people, um, nominated representatives, to go to the NEA and say they did not want this money spent on works that were obscene, pornographic, and works of homosexuals. And, and I would also add works that involved um, uh, white and black bodies together. Uh, Jesse Helms said, it's an issue of soaking the taxpayer to fund the homosexual pornography of Maplethorpe, who died of AIDS while spending the last years of his life promoting homosexuality. It got really quite nasty. Um, and Rob Maplethorpe had just died months before this exhibition, which is um, a shame in many, many ways, but I think he would have been really excited about the controversy um, that, that happened from this. So in response, the director of the Corcoran Gallery canceled the, the perfect moment, uh, June 1989, uh, and citing that the institution could not jeopardize the, the National Endowment for the Arts pulling its funding from them. This had a huge effect in the United States. Sorry, now I'm screaming, I'm trying to talk softer. I get excited about this. It had, it had a huge effect in the United States. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, it became a firestorm of them pulling a lot of money from artists. And now this endowment does not give a lot of money to individual artists. Um, in response, uh, the Washington Project for the Arts projected images of Maplethorpe's on the, on the facade, on the outside of the Corcoran, uh, with the support of the, um, the Corcoran board and the director. They, they let them use the property, close off the street, and project the images, so that was with permission that this protest was happening. Um, and in response, I think many, many, many more people saw Maplethorpe's work than would have actually walked into the Corcoran. So the Corcoran is located um, diagonal from the White House and next to the American Red Cross. This played a big part in my deciding which 
uh, work I would create. I have a kind of a bank of works that fly in and out of my head that maybe aren't realized or maybe I never have the time to look more. So I was drawing from my interest. And I went into the Corcoran, and the two bottom images are the atrium space. So you enter in on the left and the right, you have uh, this hall, which I immediately started thinking, uh, you know, this could be um, this could could be similar to something of a medical amphitheater. If I if I made it right, then maybe people would have to look down, to see the work. So I was looking at the, um, the Food and Drug Administration's ruling that gay men uh, who had had sex since 1977 could not donate blood. So then they are also um, lumped together with um, this grouping of people. And this is just to say this, this rhetoric is really confusing. It doesn't make much sense. And it really labels um, many groups of people as deviants. I looked at uh, blood donor campaigns and I started finding slogans that became uh, really like fuel to my fire. Um, don't be such a wuss. I mean, a super kind of um, macho too. Like if, if, if you're uh, not donating blood, you're a wuss. It takes all types, yes, but maybe not if you're gay. Be a hero. So then you're not, you're not, I mean, Gay, queer people are rarely allowed to be heroes. Be human, give blood, so then you're not even human if you can't uh, donate blood. And I gathered this list to use in, uh, in, just in, in part of my research. And my, my question is, when is a gay man allowed to be a hero and, what, and under what conditions is this possible? Um, I... This work manifested as a live performance that lasted over four days uh, with an installation that built up over time. So visitors came into the atrium. They were confronted by uh, hospital curtains that they could not see within. Um, I invited 11 gay male collaborators, friends, um, family, uh, to participate in this work with me, and we are all encased within uh, this um, hospital uh, theater. Uh, one particular uh, sign that became uh, imagery that became really problematic for me was this, uh, this these heroes. And so I started riffing off of the hero and thinking what, what other like what other poses could heroes take? How might they stand if they were queered up just a tiny bit? And I used this throughout the work. The 11 men uh, stitched uh, these heroes with various shades of red thread in place of their own illegal blood uh, as, as a way of envisioning uh, what or their own idea of a gay male hero. So they were stitching throughout. Men came in and left. We had, sometimes I would have one or two people in with me. Sometimes I would have 11. I, and I was in for the duration of the, of the work. So these are some of the heroes. They were transformed, I think, into heroes that desired garter belts, nipple rings, heroes with uh, faces masked, hands bound, heroes who have big hearts, heroes with pink capes, uh, heroes that were punctured, sliced, slit, and like sewn back together. And this, these acts and these movements uh, I see as gestures of defiance against institutional homophobia, which I think this law represents very much. Um, and these are just some very beautiful moments that I found afterwards. I just didn't realize at the time what, what these hands reaching around um, reaching around the curtains could do, uh, could mean as the needles poked through, sewing back together. Uh, the, uh, my role that I played, I uh, took the label of uh, lesbian, which I might not always actually identify with, but in that way it put me in the position of like a female having sex with a female, therefore my blood became the privileged blood that could be used in this. So I had, at the beginning of the performance, a pint of my blood uh, drawn. No, more than a pint. It was a lot. Uh, a lot of blood within legal and medical standards um, drawn. And I used my blood to write onto 
Uh, the curtains with text on them. So half the curtains had heroes, half the curtains had text. And I used Morse code, which I related into um, a text that one, visually the dots and the slashes uh, that I liked that they pricked, uh, slashed, and disrupted. These like really normative ways of speaking about we, uh, what you can and cannot do. Um, who can be the hero? And Morse code, only a certain uh, trained person can read it. And I also thought that about the this legal jargon that somebody must be able to read this. Maybe they have training that I, an average person cannot decipher. These are just some of the images of the curtains. So over the four days it built up, we worked from about nine to five each day following the hours of the museum. The visitors were outside of the interior action, so they could see down, they could been under, but they had to get higher to see us. And that, in a way, could have put us in the, in the position of a, of a specimen if, if you choose to see it that way. Um, some more reviews. So visitors could also see the blood bleeding through, the needles poking, and the arms, the faceless arms of the gay men pressing needles, modifying uh, and perhaps reclaiming the images. So we became kind of a secluded community over these four days. Uh, people who volunteered to come spend this time uh, we gradually filled the, the curtains. The heroes became connected to each other with pieces of thread. Uh, the performance resulted in maybe a hospital installation, uh, which I, I want to be a reminder of the divisions between healthy heterosexuals and uh, sick homosexuals. And I could see this as maybe a, a collective protest. So this is how some of the thread came together in maybe something that looks a bit like interiors of bodies. So now for the, for the second half. Um, and if anyone, I, I just really kind of quickly <laughs> th uh, went over this work, but please ask at some point if you have more questions. Um, so since then, as I stated, the the, there is a proposal out for a modification that will change this to a one-year deferral of no sex by gay men to then donate. Um, and I just wanted to point that out because this things have changed, but this is no, nowhere, it's, it's nowhere near enough. So I have a little bit that I'm going to read because I want to make sure I get this right. But to uh, further, um, as a further involuntary contribution to the hysteria and fear surrounding the linkage of blood and gay men, and and I could also extend to blood in a museum. Uh, I feel it's important to relay some of the neg negotiations that I had with the Corcoran to create the work. It was a really intensive process, and the show was. Uh, the performance was postponed a few times because we could not come to a, an agreement. And the work wa was reformulated a few times. And I'm really pleased with the way it turned out. Um, so I don't think the work is, is uh, lacking because of these negotiations. But I think the negotiation process uh, illustrated some of the outdated, scientifically disproven myths, myths of infection um, and also spoke to... Uh, bigger, um, bigger discussions about what institutions can risk doing with the public, especially within the United States, which I've experienced differently within Europe a couple times. So in the following, I want to outline, uh, outline some of the process um, and leaving out names and pointing at different people because I see individuals as institution at this point as I'm discussing this. So my original proposal was to invite gay men into the space to donate their blood, uh, which I would then use to paint onto the curtains that would encase us. So using the like potentially problematic blood. The Corcoran's administration, and I don't know what I mean when I say administration, um, lots of different people, after consulting with lawyers, made it clear that I would 
only be able to use gay men's blood if I pre-screened uh, their blood. So the response from the curator when I submitted this proposal was the biz biggest concern that the lawyer had was with the handling of blood in the galleries and any potential risk, however remote, that is being assumed by you, by visitors, and by participants in the performance. Since your idea is to have blood drawn on site and then paint with it, he is concerned that any contaminants that might be in the blood, HIV, and it goes on hepatitis, other blood-borne diseases, but HIV being first right here hit me in a really difficult way because this is kind of what the work is talking about in many ways. So this immediate reaction of, ah, but what if there's HIV, um, and I'm proposing that gay men donate the blood, that was extremely problematic. Um, I argued that uh, I would accept all risk <laughs> involved by following standard safety precautions when dealing with blood, such as wearing gloves, having medical professionals draw the blood, and not letting it come into contact with um, my or the professional or the audience's uh, open cuts or mucous membranes, since I wasn't splattering the blood. It was being placed on curtains. Uh, however, I refused to have the blood of the gay men that were invited to work with this project tested. I didn't feel like it was ethical to do that, um, and I really believed that it was an extension of fear and homophobia that the work itself was trying to address. So the response was, not having the blood tested, among other issues, could be a deal breaker. I've spoken with the pathology experts, and they believe it's likely illegal. We're checking with the D.C. Department of Health, and is certainly unsafe. The head of a pathology at one hospital called it just plain stupid. Um, so I uh, really didn't know how to deal with this. I sent many, many examples of institutions within the U.S. working with blood. Uh, there is a very um, easy to find, uh, sometimes controversial, works of blood within institutions. Um, but that wasn't quite enough. But we did get a letter from um, the D.C. Department of Health, which then stated that... Um, it's not specifically illegal to draw blood in a museum open to the public um, as long as it's done with medical training and things are properly uh, disposed of and things are kept sterile. Um, is it illegal to expose the public to unscreened blood? Well, it depends on what you mean by expose the public. Um, if their blood, if blood came into contact, again, with skin, open cuts, and mucous membranes, it, this would be highly unsafe whether it was tested or not. Um, it should be noted that some people are sensitive to blood, so they might faint. This could be a problem with the performance. Um, but it does not appear to be illegal to, to allow the public to view blood um, drawing and to have the blood on cloth. Um, and then other safety concerns by this proposed performance. As again stated, um, they're not, uh, there's no kind of permit that would regulate the blood in the performance of painting. So I also, um, I, what I typically do with my performances, a risk assessment form, which I wrote in collaboration uh, with a, a body performance art um, kind of expert who has dealt with some similar uh, situations. And again, I cited uh, other times this has happened. So perhaps that we could talk to other uh, galleries and museums who have experienced the same thing to see how they have dealt with it. Um, and I also questioned very blatantly, um, I, I wanted to know the reasoning behind this. So the curator wrote, just to reiterate, the resistance that we're encountering here com comes completely from legal, not an artistic, historical, funding, or audience perspective. This is somewhat uncharted territory for a museum. And while we want to keep pushing ahead, we as curators and programmers are having a hard time coming up with a legal and medical argument that will sway our lawyer. Ultimately, in the institution at this time, the lawyer has the final call. This was super confusing for me because I thought we had just looked at many... Um, well, we looked at the D.C. Department of Health. We had looked at other examples where it, it's not uncharted territory, actually. Um, but I realized I was coming up against something um, 
that wasn't going to budge. So I had to decide whether to pull out or reformulate the work. So based on the institution's resistance and realizing the piece needed to be modified or simply would not happen, I decided to rethink the work as the issues at stake were just too important to be silenced. Uh, so what I ended up doing was I chose to use my own safe blood and, and I had to have myself tested. Um, instead of demanding this from the gay men who agreed to help me, um, I asked them to uh, then again replace their blood with red thread. So I had to provide documentation of the testing of my blood by medical professionals for the following blood-borne pathogens and diseases, which are screened by the American Red Cross. Hepatitis B, C, West Nile virus, human T cell, syphilis, HIV, AIDS, and Chargas. Um, one of these from which is passed down from like a, a child to a mother, and I would have known like years and years and years ago if I would have had this, but this is... So I also had to sign a contract where I agreed to not knowingly, willfully, or recklessly, recklessly engage in an activity that might alter the blood test results between the time I had my blood tested, June 18th, and the time of the performance, August 8th. I do not know if I engaged in any of this reckless activity because it wasn't necessarily stated, um, but I tried to not do that. Um, and they took my word for it. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about limitations, but in a much more kind of general and abstract way. But first of all, I want to thank Lisa and the rest of the team for inviting me today. It's my first trip to Sweden and I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to have seen the Medical Museum because I've met Lisa on several occasions but never actually seen the exhibition, the show she, museum she works in. And I've seen quite a lot of European medical museums and I've met and know quite well many of the people who work in these institutions. And I don't just mean the curators and the historians, but all those who carry out the many and varied tasks of the modern museum, so administrators, researchers, educational outreach, technical support, preparators, so on and so on. And frequently, and maybe this is also in the case with you, uh, Lisa, the small numbers of staff who usually are employed in these kind of museums uh, means that despite their job description, it's clear that they tend to carry out all of these roles in a greater or lesser extent. And this has, I think, helped me to feel privileged to have had this experience because I think it's greatly advanced my understanding of how such institutions operate, um, why they do what they do or don't do, and indeed what they are even for. So although not a museum professional myself, I've worked with these teams on a number of occasions in different capacities, mostly as a researcher, an author, and an art curator. So today I want to reflect on the seminar's focus on interventions with collections, the role of the independent art curator in interpretation and meaning making, and my thoughts on why medical museums are such popular settings for this kind of activity, for artistic activity. But I want to do it uh, from the position of already having the experience of working with these collections. I'm not actually going to refer to specific projects that I've worked on, and that's to partly because, as I mentioned, I've already mentioned to some of the colleagues speaking today, is that my laptop had a meltdown in the last week and I couldn't open any of my pictures, any of my PDFs, and it's just been a bit of a nightmare. Um, so I had to kind of think, well, how am I going to do this paper? So I decided to do it in a more general way. But in the end, um, at the very last minute, with the help of someone else, I was able to rescue a few images. So what I'm going to do is just press the button, go through some of the images. They're all projects I've worked on. They're mostly the actual artworks. Some are installation. Uh, some are put, uh, creating the exhibition. Some are good quality, some not so good. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. And um, if you then want to ask me about particular works or the projects, we can do that later. So please, um, I apologize for that, and I hope you'll bear with me. Um, OK. Uh, one of the other things I'm not talking about and has hardly been touched on today is audiences. So um, I think it's crucial that we do talk about audiences in many respects, and especially for perhaps possibly for the smaller museums, audiences is even more important than want larger ones. And I'm not so sure, but I won't be talking about that today. 
So I'll start with interventions and uh, collections. Um, I think most people here today will share a broad understanding of what we mean by making an intervention in a museum collection and that the museum as an institution constitutes both an idea and a practice which lends itself very well to institutional critique. So whether in the form of literary studies, academic conferences or artistic practice, institutional critique has consistently questioned the inclusions and omissions of the institutional framework. It highlights its shortcomings and it highlights the potential for a more complex picture of counter-narratives and positions. So I'm sure that we're all agreed that the museum is, uh, to use those ubiquitous terms, a multi-layered discursive site which can generate far more questions than it attempts to provide answers. So artists, and I use that word broadly to include writers, musicians and other performers, have been creating artworks with and intervening in museums for so long, and I think this point's already been made today by Jason, it can be argued that it's become something of a genre or a trope. And even if genre is exactly the kind of institutional categorization that they may be aiming to disrupt or deny. What is more, it's not only museum collections who attract this approach. Again, we've heard about how uh, private collections, stately homes, and university collections uh, are also frequently used, and they spill out beyond the confines of the institution's dedicated spaces. Well, I'm all in favour of this. It's what I enjoy doing, it's what I do, I, so especially scientific collections in my case, and having the opportunity to work with scientists in different fields and in different ways. But there are often a couple of things that niggle away at me with these uh, kind of projects. So firstly, I wonder why it's often thought that a museum intervention has to take the form of an institutional critique. Uh, intervention pr projects are quite commonplace, as we know, and institutional critique can be both somewhat repetitive and heavy-handed in its aims, even if the outcomes are varied, fresh and exciting. And the second thing that tends to niggle at me, is that I often feel that there appears to be an implied belief that institutions are incapable of or unwilling to critique themselves, and that they're so bound up with their institutional practices that they must hand this responsibility to others, and that the others who can do this are artists. And I think that's already been uh, touched upon today by Miranda. So to take the first point, we all know there's a great deal of ways to think about what um, an artistic intervention is, both conceptually and physically, uh, but a critical intervention and institutional critique in general can easily fall into the realm of negativity, of simply fault-finding. Now, I think in itself there's nothing wrong with that. Questioning and criticising will always indicate a kind of negativity, no matter what people say about the elusive goal of constructive criticism. But as you can imagine, it can test the most patient of collections curators and it may result in institutional resistance, which can easily develop into conflict. I wonder sometimes if artistic interventions embracing institutional critique could be a little more subtle. There is a tendency towards negative judgmentalism, which also implies there's a better way of doing things. Perhaps turning to the origins of the word critique as discerning something, grasping its meaning both on an intuitive and intellectual level, but not necessarily in an unfavourable or pessimistic way, could avoid some of the more negative connotations that institutional critique seems to generate. We don't always have to use critique as a sledgehammer to crack open the nut of institutionalisation. I want to um, very briefly... See, I'm being a bit slow not getting through these. I'll come back to them. But, uh, yeah, this one. I want to briefly talk about this exhibition. Uh, this was held at the Berlin Medical History Museum in 2013, and the title was Visite am Depot. Now, we're all familiar with artists being keen to get behind the scenes of institutions, to explore the physical and conceptual spaces that are usually closed off to us, and then to open them up in some way. This exhibition consisted of the contents of the stores and archives represented in the museum's temporary exhibition space, that's what we can see there, and placed on specially built shelving systems and also using existing 
showcases. Now, um, this one here, these, these pictures, these, uh, these were large-scale photographs of what the storerooms looked like before the objects were removed. And these were hung in the exhibition space alongside the actual um, objects on the shelves. So what they did um, in what was happening here was um, not a mirror representation of behind the scenes, but it does give some kind of a glimpse of what's, what they're like. Now, I show this particular installation, it's not one of my projects, um, to uh, brief, well, bluntly illustrate how the practice of institutional critique can be an act of seeing and apprehending and understanding the institution rather than simply negatively judging it. But more precisely, I use this to also illustrate my second point, the nagging implication that institutions do not, will not, and cannot perform an institutional critique upon themselves. For this installation was an internal museum display, and the photographs were taken by the institution's photographer. There were no intentions for it to be considered an art installation. But I'm showing it here to provide a concrete example of a display in order to make that specific point. But I also need to say that as far as institutional critique goes, that museums do it all the time. They're always questioning themselves, their exhibition policies, their collecting strategies, their display and dissemination of information, ideas and knowledge and so on. But perhaps because so much of this tends to be internalised, it may no, not always be obvious to us outsiders why an institution decides to make no or limited changes. And it may be boring, but the practicalities and financial realities of running a museum and the fact they rarely have any real autonomy can frequently outweigh a sometimes fervent desire to consider change and do things a little differently. But perhaps there's also a view from the institutional perspective that artists and external curators are wild and free agents whose lack of institutional affiliation permits them to make provocative statements in challenging the status quo. It's been said today, and I've heard it before, that some museums invite artists into the museum because the artists can exercise this so-called freedom, where the institution dare not do it themselves. It may be so, but I have to say I've never actually come across this scenario. And I think this, this outlook simply serves to demonstrate that the institution is damned if they do invite the artist to intervene, and they're damned if they don't. It can't be denied, though, that fresh insights place the museum in a very healthy and productive place to be. But it should also be recognised that most museums, these days at least, and again, Jason <laughs> referred to this as well, they're not some fabled, static and tautological domain. They're places of vibrant thinking and creativity, albeit frequently bound by sets of limitations which cannot always be fully transcended. And some of those limita limitations are of a distinctly practical nature, and others, of course, are much more nebulous and tricky to resolve. Let's just go back and show a few other images. So these are just some of the works that artists I've worked with recently have been creating in response to scientific collections, but they're just the works themselves, mostly. So this issue of limitations and boundaries, um, it brings me to the role of the independent art curator, such as myself, within the limits of interpretation and meaning-making. So, although curating is one of the things I do, I don't hold to the idea that all exhibitions need a curator, even if they do need some kind of organiser. There are plenty of exhibitions out there in museums that have been created by an artist with the cooperation of the museum team, but with no need or desire for an additional curator. I would argue, though, that there are some circumstances where it does work well, especially if it's a group show or there's no nearby, the artists don't live nearby, not nearby the venue and so on and so forth. Now, in my own case, unless I've been a curatorial researcher on somebody else's project, which was largely the case before I moved to Germany, I've initiated projects as an independent freelance curator with museums myself. So my own role with both the artists and the institution is built in from the beginning. 
And of course, there are a number of approaches, types, and strategies of curatorial engagement because it's a constantly evolving role. But questions regarding curatorial authorship with regard to uh, interpretation and meaning has been on the cultural agenda almost as long as institutional critique. Most of these discussions pertain to the institution of art museums, but the discussion is just as relevant to other types of institutions, and they tend to revolve around concepts of the author and authorial control. Who is making the meaning, the artist or the curator? After all, exhibition making is a kind of making. What is the site of meaning? Is it the artwork or is it the exhibition? The two camps forcefully articulate their divisions, with artists insisting, to put it in crude terms, what their work means, and curators arguing that they have the right to interpret it as they choose. Well, it seems to me inevitable that every time a work is shown or discussed in different contexts, of course it will acquire new levels of meaning and interpretation, and these are beyond the artist's control. The works are what Beatrice von Bismarck, professor of the Academy of Visual Arts in Leipzig, refers to as being in action. The difficulties of these disputations may be lessened when the artwork is newly commissioned for a new project that is initiated and led by either the artist and or curator, because from the beginning there's perhaps a closer working relationship between the artist and curator and what the aims of the project are and how to achieve common goals. Now, I'm being very simplistic about the way I'm explaining this, but it's because I want to point to what happens when um, we move on to museum collections and um, those relationships, because then you open up a minefield of manifold contexts and interpretations. And um, the institutional views regarding the meaning and interpretation also has to be taken into consideration. So additional strands of complexity emerge because the collections or single objects are already suffused with an historical legacy of meaning which can place limitations on their use and the interpretation of them in other contexts. And these limitations are something that both the artist and the art curator need to negotiate within the institution and its own curatorial practice at an early stage. Von Bismarck has succinctly written that the freelancer inhabits a hybrid role oscillating between different positions in a practice conditioned by impermanence, performativity and transitoriness, the critical potential of which lies in the freedom to continually reformulate the constellation of operations on the one hand and positions on the other. She goes on to say, the relationship of curators to objects, to artists, to others and to the public must always be renegotiated and fixed only temporarily, the role of curator is playable, must be a flexible, dynamic and contingent constellation of operations and positions, a specific form of criticality in the art field. And I actually quote her directly because she actually states those things much clearer and much better than I could. And she acknowledges, as we all should, that institutions that mediate between art and the public are authorities that consecrate and legitimise. They have obligations which can make them torn between artistic and economic, individual, institutional, anaesthetic, social, sorry, not anaesthetic, aesthetic, <laughs> social, imminent and contextual demands. Now, these quotes from von Bismarck put the role of the independent curator and the, re the relationship they have with the museum and the obligations uh, with the museum in you know, quite a neat nutshell. But where I do depart a little at least with von Bismarck is that uh, this seems to legit legitimise her claim that freelance practice plays fast and loose with codes and does not have permanent connection to the effects of institutional normalisation, so it seems risky. Now, I think, uh, although the, there's... I don't actually disagree with what she's uh, actually stating, and I may be overplaying this, uh, but I think that's just the kind of terminology which can be alarming to some institutions. For although it's true that the independent curator is not tied to a single institution's philosophy or methodologies or loyalties, 
I do think that the freelancer has an obligation of responsibility to any one institution that she or he is working with at any one time. And that responsibility, which I also extend to artists, includes not just an awareness, but also an understanding and willingness to confer and work with and within the parameters that the institutions are bound by. Now, without wanting in any way to suggest I would like to restrict creative thinking and practice, I think that also means not playing fast and loose. Um, now, that might seem unfashionable to some, I, I realise that, but, but I happen to believe that institutional critique and interventions can create and inhabit a conceptual and productive space of encounter by taking boundaries into account. It is a point taken up uh, very similarly by Emily Pethick, who is the director of the Showroom Gallery in London, and she says such encounters constitute a methodology in themselves, uh, they are a process. The curatorial can then be thought of as unbounded framework that is speculative and responsive and allows for the possibility that you might not know at the outset of a project what you are grappling with and that it may change in the process of being realised. Artistic and curatorial practices have to be negotiated within a whole range of factors and so cannot be entirely borderless. There must be a horizon. And it's often at the point of which obstacles and boundaries are encountered that the challenging practices and ideas emerge and create change. So in other shorter words, you don't always have to kick against the system to produce challenging and innovative in interventions and institutional critiques. So everything I've said so far relates to interventions and institutional critiques in most kinds of collections. Um, but there are, of course, different types of museums and, um, and different types of institutions. And so all of these have their own sets of ideas and practices, not to mention uh, their own sets of objects and archives, which are unique to it. But along with museums of natural history, medical history, anatomy and pathology museums seem to hold an engrossing fascination for these kinds of projects. So, uh, just what is it that makes today's medical museums um, so different, so appealing? Well, like any other museum of objects, um, medical museums follow both their own and more general museological procedures and academic research to present their subject from different perspectives, of course. But then uh, it's also true that they're conditioned by the current episteme at, at any one time. Like other museums, medical history museums aim to tell the history of its subject through its holdings, and of course they're crammed with objects which, although heavily mediated, nevertheless remain relatively unchanged in themselves. And like other museums, they actively create gaps in their narratives. Intellectual gaps, knowledge gaps, emotional gaps, spatial gaps, aesthetic gaps, and of course it's these gaps that proved to be so popular in the pursuit of institutional critique, for they are always in a state of becoming, they're just waiting to be filled. Now these gaps are partially determined by the limitations of the museum, and those limitations include, as we've already heard, ethical considerations. Most museums have a code of ethical responsibility, but medical history museums probably have a more intense and dense series of ethical positions to implement, to implement than most others, both externally and self-determined. This is partially true of museums, uh, sorry, particularly true with museums uh, that have human specimens. And um, indeed, many of the collections of human specimens are not actually open to uh, the public. Um, they're within hospitals and university environments, and they operate according to very strict regulations because of the ethical and also emotional responses that dis the display of human material can evoke. Now, it's partly uh, the combination of ethical and emotional aspects of medical museums which focus so much upon the human condition, which I believe makes them so attractive to artists who want to fill in the gaps that the museum is unable uh, to fill. There are many people who, either through um, a morbid or, or a puerile curiosity, are only interested in the more grisly medical procedures or particularly unusual specimens of pathological tissue. 
And let's face it, we are all fascinated to some extent by these. But for those who move beyond that, the Medical Museum offers up a whole host of compelling facets about what it means to be human and what we are capable of being and doing as humans. It's true that all museums have a reductionist approach to their collections because they cannot manage them any other way, hence the gaps that we've already previously mentioned. But in a medical museum, as so often in Western medicine in general, the body itself, the person, is also reduced to a fragmented representation, both physically and philosophically. Today, using organic material in teaching medicine is becoming something of a rarity because its representation, its role and function, is transformed by the highly artificial environments of molecular laboratories and computerized imagery. But whether the body is displayed as a series of um, bits and bytes or indeed the dissected constituent parts um, of the body that we see in preserved specimens, then something most definitely seems to be missing. Uh, Thomas Schnalker is the director of Berlin's Medical History Museum, and they do display human specimens. And he goes so far as to say that almost everything is missing here, everything that makes a human being aside from the pure morphology of the fixed body structure. Psychology, emotion, sociality, culture, politics, religion, but also the human's um, merely organic being. We can't find anything that could be said about a human being who once lived as a person. There are no signs of pain, suffering, dying, death and decay inscribed on the surfaces anymore. Well, since um, 2009, um, Thomas Schnalker has initiated a series of artistic interventions in his museum, which is at the series is actually called Interventions. And it's specifically to address these gaps, while at the same time he opines that art ultimately makes little difference to the medical museum and its current conventions, unless it articulates very definite, tailored responses embedded in a thorough understanding and a willingness to work within its limitations, even when engaging with ideas about eclipsing them. At the centre of these limitations, and conversely our desire to surpass them, is the human condition. It's what makes, it's what makes us human. So, um, the reductionism afforded to the human body, ingrained in medicine and its representation in the museum, should lead us to differentiate between the, what uh, the British novelist Hilary Mantle refers to as qualities that can be measured and qualities that can't, without stigmatising the latter as less useful. The heart's electrical pattern can be traced, but not the wayward impulses of love and hate. Those who do not believe in what cannot be measured or quantified are on shaky ground. Their inner reality is doomed to be alarmingly divorced from the reality of most of those about them. So, in conclusion, I would uh, say something again that Jason's already touched upon today, is that when embark embarking on artistic interventions and institutional critiques of the medical museum, we would do well to consider what exactly it is we are addressing. Is it the institution of medical science? Is it the institution of medical history? Or the institution of the museum? Or is it the condition of being human? So, <laughs> I'm sorry the pictures don't really <laughs> correspond to what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah and Mary, for two inspiring talks. Uh, uh, my um, impression is that we have a lot of questions in this audience, so perhaps I will open up directly for questions. Do we have questions? Yes. Uh, on? Yeah. I was thinking the first speaker, you were <coughs> talking about the limiting conditions at the museum in Washington. And <coughs> well, there's two aspects. One is this, which you already indicated that in knowledge, there's the precautionary principle. If you don't have sufficient knowledge, it's better. It's like in the climate discussion, too. 
you have a precautionary principle, which is a kind of ethic also. Uh, you don't act in a particular way until you have more knowledge. The other aspect, I think, was the reality of the institution. Um, if you have a visitor who, for some reason, gets a cut or something, and then comes back and sues the museum uh, and says, well, I was uh, in, affected or you know, I got some blood on me or whatever. I mean, there's a huge uh, bill to look at there. It's going to cost a lot. There's insurance and so on. How is the insurance situation in this case? This is another dimension I just want to bring into the picture to make sense of some of the lawyers' positions. Sure, yeah, they would have to insure me, the work themselves, yeah. So, of course, them being sued was definitely a major concern, and I think it's pretty unfortunate in the U.S. that that is the case in the way that, at least in Scandinavia, Europe, I have never experienced it like that. But, yeah, it is a reality. Yeah. I actually have a question connecting to that issue. And... Um, I was thinking about the correspondence that you had with the museum. Did you publish it or show it in relation to the exhibition? Um, at the time of the, I mean, this was happening up, up through the opening of the exhibition, obviously. I did produce a small publication that was handed out during the exhibition. And this uh, talked about the, the problematics of the policy and the information I'd gathered. But at the time, I thought that I had to separate everything that was happening. I also needed time to step back, and I was still working within this institution, and I, I did appreciate all the help that I was getting. Um, but then, yeah, maybe four months ago, I had an opportunity to readdress this work in specificities that, or in, especially because the law had been changed. So I took this opportunity to produce a publication um, that discussed, in brief, some of uh, what had happened as basically what I was saying to you, as succinct as and as precise, but not going into super um, like theoretical and philosoph philosoph uh, philosophy into why or why this did not happen, but staying like pretty factual. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting, this idea that some of the collections that we look after carry sort of stronger ethical you know concerns than others be it medical collections or mm -hmm. some ethnographic collections as well um and that that then when we invite in artists and and let them loose or not um that there's a another set of responsibilities there i was just wondering whether you had any particular examples from your work with medical museums of if there have been projects that artists have proposed that have been sort of ruled out on those kind of ethical grounds? No, actually, I haven't. I mean, there are plenty around. I mean, uh, other people today have talked about the history of, uh, more, you know, things long ago. And um, I, I think, you know, uh, you mentioned other artists who've worked with blood. This has been a, 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 an ongoing problem with some people as, as well. Um, or with semen or other bodily fluids and, and so on. But for me, no, I actually haven't had one. And the only thing that came to close to the ethical thing was this one person who had refused to let us use things in the, the collection at the university because it was really not only, I, I suspect, a practical thing, his idea that the objects could only be shown in pristine condition and shouldn't be shown if they were just all jumbled up, but because it, this was actually a psychology collection and a lot of the collection objects were machines that were tested to, um, well, test all sorts of things from, from children to adults and so on. But there was nothing actually there con what we might consider controversial. Coming back to the fast and loose and in a way thinking forward to the projects that are going to take place here. Because one of the things that we've had recently with um, a lot of our projects with students particularly but also young researchers and it, it can be artists and designers but I was thinking more specifically about the students is that we have a kind of we've brought together a lot of particularly our fashion and textiles collections into a store 
and there is no possibility for fast and loose. And a lot of the process has been educating the tutors to say, you need to communicate well with your students so they know the question they're asking, they know what they want to come and see. And with the rise of sort of open access and, you know, we saw Lauren looking at the fans, mm. that when you're working with these artists, how much work are you expecting them to do? Because I think in some cases, if we go back to the, like the Grayson scenario, some people are granted that sort of, okay, open your doors. But for most people, they are being, they need to do a quite considerable amount of work to hone an area in which they are going to put some meaningful research together to develop a, a dialogue with an object, a set of objects. And I wonder what you, how your communication works in that relationship. Yeah, it might be different. Uh, I think it's different in different institutions. And um, I think, in general, the museum people I know who've worked on these projects are fairly open. And it's the university ones who are not so open. And I, but I think that's mainly to do with uh, time constraints. If, if curating, the, looking after these objects are not your main responsibility, I'm afraid you don't have a lot of time to spend with the artists. And in a way, um, that's where my role becomes quite important because then you're just one person that they're dealing with and you build, I build up a relationship with those people. And so I'm the kind of person who's the main communicator with them. And, um, but that's not to say artists and the custodians of the collections don't communicate. They do. Uh, but I think I do a lot of the groundwork to start with in exactly that way in preparing people about what it might involve and, and how you would go about that. Um, so, yeah, if it's not your main job, then I, I mean, most people, they don't answer emails for weeks on end and artists go, oh, I want to make this work and I want to go in and do this and no one answers my emails and I can't get them on the phone and, oh, now they've gone on a research trip. Very frustrating. Artists have to understand that they're not a priority in these kind of things. But for the artists, of course, it is their priority. It's their work. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a tough one. It just varies, I think. A lot of its personalities as well. 